It now gives me great pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker for the current strategy forum. Amory B. Lovins is an American consultant, experimental physicist, and 1993 MacArthur Fellow, and has been active at the nexus of energy, resources, environment, development, and security in more than 50 countries for 35 years, including 14 years based in England. He is widely considered among the world's leading authorities on energy, especially its efficient use and sustainable supply, and he is a fertile innovator in integrative design. Mr. Lovins has briefed 20 heads of state, given expert testimony in eight countries and 20 plus states, delivered thousands of lectures and published 29 books and hundreds of papers. In 1980 and 81, he served on the U.S. Department of Energy's Senior Advisory Panel, Senior, excuse me, Senior Advisory Board. And in 1999 to 2001 and 2006 to 2008, on the Defense Science Board, Task Forces on Military Energy Strategy. Dr. Alvin Weinberg, former director of Oak Ridge National Laboratory, called him, quote, surely the most articulate writer on energy in the whole world today one of the Western world's most influential energy thinkers. Dr. John Ahern, former Vice President of Resources for the Future, remarked that, quote, Amory Lovins has done more to assemble and advance understanding of energy efficiency opportunities than any other single person. If you have taken the opportunity to read some of Amory's work on our website, you would see that he has been assisting the Navy in solving energy efficiency problems for over 20 years. We are honored to have Mr. Arm Amory Lovins here today. Please join me in welcoming him. Well, thank you, Admiral. After that introduction, I can't wait to hear what I'm going to say. Uh, <clears throat> at Rocky Mountain Institute, our strategic focus is shifting the U.S. completely from oil and coal to efficient use and renewable energy by 2050. Our peer-reviewed uh, grand synthesis called Reinventing Fire to be published this autumn will show how this ambitious transition can be led by business for profit and accelerated by our military in support of its mission. Today, I'll give you a very quick sneak preview of how saving and displacing fossil fuels can work better and cost less than buying and burning them. Now, most analysts say that such big energy shifts as getting completely off oil and coal need just technology and policy. But adding two even bigger plays, integrative design as business innovation via new business models and competitive strategies, can create extraordinarily rewarding and disruptive business and security opportunities, as I'll describe. And I'm going to summarize for you how to save $5 trillion net present value by running the officially projected 2050 economy with no oil, no coal, one-third less natural gas, no nuclear energy. This will require no new inventions, no new federal taxes, mandates, subsidies, or laws. And it assumes that carbon emissions, oil insecurity, and all other externalities are worth zero a conservatively low estimate. Now, there are two big uh, narratives here, oil and electricity. Oil and power stations each release more than two-fifths of our fossil carbon. Nearly three-fourths of our electricity powers buildings. The same fraction of our petroleum fuels transportation. The remaining electricity and oil run factories. So very efficient buildings and factories are the key to getting off oil and coal. Let's start with oil. America burns oil costing about $2 billion a day. Its hidden costs paid not at the pump, but through our taxes or our health or our security are even bigger. They include a half trillion dollars a year sucked out of our economy, mainly by OPEC's monopoly pricing that our oil dependence makes possible. Then Roger Stern at Princeton estimates we pay another half trillion dollars a year to sustain military forces whose primary mission is Persian Gulf interventions. That's about 10 times what we pay for oil from the Persian Gulf, and it rivals our total defense expenditure at the height of the Cold War. And of course, our global efforts to protect sea lanes for shipping oil and other goods 
will probably come, as the Admiral mentioned, under increasing challenge. Thirdly, volatile oil prices whipsaw our economy. For 40 years, oil price spikes, uh, <coughs> shown in yellow, uh, have preceded every recession, shown in red. The market current, uh, currently prices oil volatility at another half trillion dollars a year. That's three of them so far. Uh, so just our oil dependence's three main hidden costs add up to about one and a half trillion dollars a year. That's about 11 percent of GDP, not counting the cost of buying the oil. Pretty expensive stuff. Oil is also finite. The Pentagon is preparing to need no oil, and the rest of us should too. Now, automobiles use most of our oil, so let's explore how to make autos oil-free by 2050 save three to third trillion dollars net present value and spawn some vast new industries and millions of good jobs. The key is in automotive physics. A typical mid-sized sedan loses 86% of its fuel energy en route to the wheels, from the tank to the wheels. And after the minor use of accessories, only 13% shown in yellow actually moves the car and most of that so-called tractive load heats the air that the car is pushing aside or heats the tires and road. Only the last 6%, the very last yellow bar, actually accelerates the car and then heats the brakes when you stop. Oh, it gets worse. Only a 20th of the mass you're accelerating is you. 1920th is the heavy steel car. Uh, so only about a 20th of 6%, or 0.3% of the fuel energy ends up moving the driver. This is not very gratifying. Uh, <coughs> But it is what you get by focusing on improving the powertrain where the red losses are because, you know, it's like somebody asked Willie Sutton, why do you rob banks? He says, because that's where the money is. And automakers have been squeezing losses out of the powertrain for over a century and they're very, very good at it. But an even better approach does it the other way around. It starts at the wheels, rigorously shrinking down all of those three yellow components of tractive load and then every unit of energy you save at the wheels saves six more units. You don't need to waste getting it to the wheels. So starting your savings downstream wins seven to one leverage from wheels to tank. In contrast, a more efficient powertrain saves just one unit per one with no leverage. Now, we just saw that two thirds of a typical car's tractive load is caused by its weight. And yet, for the past quarter century, epidemic obesity has made our two-ton steel autos gain weight twice as fast as we have. <laughs> now, ultra-light, ultra-strong materials like carbon fiber composites can make dramatic weight savings snowball and can make autos simpler and cheaper to build. Lighter and more slippery autos then need less force to move them so their propulsion system shrinks. Such Vehicle fitness then makes electric cars affordable because their batteries or fuel cells get smaller, lighter, and cheaper. And <clears throat> these innovations together can transform automakers from trying to wring pennies out of Victorian steel stamping and engine technologies to the steeply falling costs of three mutually reinforcing technologies, advanced materials, manufacturing, and propulsion. The result will be as game-changing as shifting from small refinements in mechanical typewriters to the dramatic Moore's Law-driven gains in computers. And of course, computers and electronics are America's biggest industry. Typewriter makers have vanished. So vehicle fitness, taking out the weight and drag, opens a sound business path to save twice as much oil in 40 years as we thought possible, making affordable the electrification that can save the rest of the oil. China will lead this if we don't and leaders will beat laggards, just as Toyota's jump into hybrids 14 years ago is still challenging competitors to catch up, only faster because hybrids have just one learning curve, not three. Such breakthrough vehicles are rapidly emerging. Uh, two years ago, uh, our institute's fifth spin-off, Bright Automotive, now partnered with General Motors, showed this uh, three to 12-fold more fuel-efficient aluminum van Unlike other plug-in hybrids, it needs no subsidy to attract fleet buyers because its fitness eliminated most of its costly batteries. But what if we make it even lighter? Well, 11 years ago, my team and two European industry partners designed this uncompromised, uh, safe, high-performance, carbon-fiber, mid-size suburban assault vehicle. Uh, it saved 
over half the weight and nearly three-fourths of the fuel of a normal SUV. Toyota's carbon fiber plug-in hybrid concept car of four years ago is as spacious as a Prius, but with half its fuel use and one-third its weight. In the day before they showed it, the world's biggest maker of carbon fiber announced a $300 million factory to mass-produce carbon fiber car parts for Toyota, not a phrase previously heard in the industry. And then they added four more automakers. This year, Volkswagen showed this 230-mile-a-gallon carbon fiber two-seater slated for 2013 production. So is a BMW carbon fiber all-electric sedan. Audi aims to beat both of them by a year. Oh, by the way, light, slippery carbon fiber cars are, they, they go very fast and they are radar stealthy. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, now, aerospace, of course, uses a lot of carbon composites, but automaking would need three orders of magnitude higher volume and lower cost. I started to gain hope that this huge gap might be bridgeable when I met Dave Taggart at the Lockheed Martin Skunk Works. Uh, there he had led the design of a 95% carbon uh, advanced tactical fighter airframe that was one-third lighter but two-thirds cheaper than the 72% metal joint strike fighter-based design. Uh, well, as you might expect, uh, when he came up with this design optimally manufacturable from carbon composites, he couldn't find a military customer. It kind of activated the immune system of the JSF community uh, for something that radical. So, so he quit, and I hired him to lead the design of that halved weight, quadruple to sextuple deficiency carbon fiber SUV. And his team then showed how such integratively designed ultralight, ultra-safe cars don't need to cost more to build. Now, the airframe-inspired SUV body, which, as you see, is suspended from rings like an airframe, not built up from a tub, has just 14 parts, each made with just one low-pressure die set. That saves up to 99% of the third of a billion dollar tooling cost. Each part can be lifted with one or two hands and no hoist. In fact, the biggest part on the side here, I can briefly lift with one finger. The parts then snap precisely together for bonding without the robotic body shop. Laying color in the mold can even, if you wish, eliminate the paint shop. So there go the two hardest and costliest parts of automaking. The propulsion system is also two-thirds lighter, uh, <coughs> or sorry, two-thirds smaller, and hence lighter and cheaper. So all of these savings together pay for the carbon fiber, making the ultralighting roughly free. And carbon fiber itself is probably about to get much cheaper. Now, new manufacturing technology from our fourth spin-off, or its seven competitors, can make carbon fiber parts <coughs> like uh, this test piece for ballistic military helmets now shipping. It's tougher than titanium and can make th things like this in one minute, scaling to automotive cost and speed with aerospace performance. In fact, <coughs> let me pass this around. It's uh, really light, but Tom Friedman has whacked that as hard as he could with a sledgehammer without even scuffing it, so don't worry about hurting it. Uh, now, if we built all uh, U.S. autos this way, it would be like finding a Saudi Arabia under Detroit because ultralighting saves half the weight and half the fuel. The auto gets safer and peppier. It gets safer because that stuff can absorb 12 times the crash energy per pound of steel. Uh, and yet the auto costs about the same to make. Now, to achieve such big savings in weight, you have to go several times around the design spiral as we do in naval architecture. First, you make the vehicle as light and slippery as we can think of. Then you need less power to run it. That lends itself to more advanced uh, powertrain, uh, which also gets smaller, and the chassis components get lighter and smaller. And all that leaves more space, which is good because you're on the road with uh, heavy stuff. Uh, <clears throat> more packaging space, more crush space. And then you go around the spiral again, and as you go, components get smaller as their structural loads shrink. But also, you often eliminate components altogether. For example, a good series hybrid, which becomes cheap when you have a two or three times less tractive load, can eliminate the transmission, clutch, flywheel, axles, differentials, drive shaft, U-joint, starter, alternator, all that stuff goes away, then you get jumps in weight saving, and then you decompound them some more. Now, at first, the ultralighting may seem too costly because of the special materials and so on, 
But after several recursive exploitations of this snowballing of weight savings, the mass decompounding, you need so little carbon fiber, electric traction, storage, and so on, and the manufacturing uh, of the structures gets so much simpler that they pay for the carbon fiber, making the ultralighting approximately free. Now, to achieve such results, you also have to design in the future, not in the past. When the Soviets shot down Francis Gary Powers' U-2 spy plane in 1960, Kelly Johnson did not say, I'm going to make a little bit better U-2. He said, I want to own the skies for decades. Let's do a Blackbird. I don't know how, but we'll figure out. It took him about 13 months. And Johnson understood that such an airplane was impossible within the conventional design context. He knew that design is like a rubber band. If you try to stretch it too far from the conventional design space, you encounter more and more resistance, and ultimately the rubber band breaks. But if you jump instead to the new design space you really want to be in, then you can stretch the rubber band back as far as needed for technologies that aren't ripe yet, and then as they mature, the rubber band relaxes to where you want to be. And this is true not just of aircraft, but of all vehicles, and indeed all kinds of design. Now, ultimately, then, we can make super-efficient autos cheap, but meanwhile, while they're still not cheap, to sell enough of them to make batteries and fuel cells readily affordable by working down those learning curves, we're going to need a policy called a fee-bait. That means rebates for efficient new autos paid for by fees on inefficient autos. Europe has five countries with successful fee-bait programs. The biggest is in France, and in its first two years, it nearly doubled the pace uh, I'm sorry, it, it, it doubled the, uh, the, sh the market share of the most efficient autos. It cut the least efficient model's market share by two-thirds, and it tripled the speed, shown here, of improving automotive efficiency. And that happened at both high and low gasoline prices. Uh, so in this country, fee baits phasing out by 2035 could unlock a $2.5 trillion oil saving rising to $4 trillion if smart federal and private fleet purchases speed up the retooling. And if Congress won't do fee baits, the states can. Uh, California, where three-fourths of the uh, voters seem to want it, is well along that road. And with its 16 state partners, California is two-fifths of the national auto market, which is enough to swing the whole thing. Now, the same physics and business logic I've described for autos also apply to other vehicles. For example, saving half of 18-wheel heavy trucks fuel at a quarter the cost of the fuel is becoming a reality. Walmart already saved 60% of its truck's fuel use in the past five years per ton mile. Next, if we can harmonize state standards, we can raise that one half fuel saving to two thirds by hooking two trailers to one tractor with better safety and less road wear. Also in the cards are doubled and tripled efficiency aircraft. Uh, these are a few examples. Uh, and these planes and trucks can save another net present value $1 trillion. That's before we get as good at, at designing as nature is, as the late great aerodynamicist Paul McCready taught us by diagramming some of the interesting uh, <coughs> aerodynamic features, including even air advanced manufacturing techniques that are employed by a very well-designed airframe called a California Condor. Uh, <coughs> now, as we design and build vehicles better, we can also use them smarter. If this graph of weekday traffic congestion were an electricity load shape, we would throw a lot of IT-enabled demand response and smart grid techniques at it to try to flatten it out. But by not yet doing that for road traffic, we are wasting many billions of dollars a year through idle people, idle roads, and idle vehicles. But now we can charge real-time driving costs per mile, not per gallon. We can use smart IT to enhance transit and empower car sharing and ride sharing. We can allow lucrative smart growth real estate models so people are already pretty much where they want to be. We can use intelligent transportation systems to make traffic free flowing. And together, these approaches have the proven potential to give us the same or better access with 46 to 84 percent less driving, saving another $0.8 trillion. Even more disruptive will be solutions economy business models like Zipcar that lease you a mobility or access service instead of selling you a car. And this could boost the asset utilization of cars from, 40, from uh, 4% to perhaps an order of magnitude more. Even heavy trucks can save a third of their ton miles and another third of a trillion dollars just by intensifying recent trends in smarter logistics, fewer tons hauled fewer miles, and better coordination with rail freight. 
So put all these things together, and 40 years hence, 36% more Americans can enjoy the enhanced mobility of a 158% bigger economy with 90% more auto driving, 118% more trucking, yet use no oil and save nearly $4 trillion net present value, including the fuel infrastructure bought or avoided. These 125 to 240 mile a gallon equivalent autos can use, by the way, any mixture of electricity, <coughs> hydrogen fuel cells, and advanced biofuels. Trucks and airplanes can realistically use advanced biofuels or hydrogen, <coughs> or trucks could even burn natural gas, but no vehicles will need oil. Any biofuels we might need, uh, maximum 3 million barrels a day, could be made without displacing cropland or harming climate or soil fertility. My team speeds up these kinds of oil savings by what we call institutional acupuncture. We figure out where the business logic is congested and not flowing properly. We stick little needles in it to get it flowing. Uh, with partners ranging from Ford to Walmart to the Pentagon, I think most of the six sectors we need to transform are already at or past the tipping point where this long effort starts to get easier. Boeing, for example, converted its 787 Dreamliner's leapfrog efficiency into a powerful competitive strategy. Now Boeing Commercial Airplane's former CEO has led Ford to become a top lightweighter and the world's second most profitable automaker. In 2009, mainstream analysts even started to see peak oil not in supply but in demand. ExxonMobil agreed that U.S. gasoline use had peaked in aught seven and will only decline. Dan Jurgen said all the rich countries' combined oil use had peaked in aught five and will only decline. Deutsche Bank forecast world oil use will peak around 2016 and then by 2030 will fall to 8% below today's level just through electrification of light duty vehicles. In short, oil is becoming uncompetitive <clears throat> even at low prices before it becomes unavailable even at high prices. Now, I mentioned that this transition can be sped by military leadership, so let me explain how. Four big ideas have so far driven the revolution in military affairs, speed, stealth, precision, and networking. In 2008, our Defense Science Board's panel's report, More Fight, Less Fuel, recommended adding two more of what we used to call strategic vectors, endurance and resilience. We found that pervasive waste of energy in the battle space and fixed facilities' 99% dependence on vulnerable commercial electric grids are hazarding mission success and incurring huge costs in blood, treasure, and lost combat effectiveness. But endurance and resilience can turn these handicaps into revolutionary new capabilities at similar or lower capital cost and with much lower operating cost. So let's start with endurance. In World War II, the Allies' heavy steel forces, someone said, floated to victory on a sea of oil, six-sevenths of it from Texas. Today's forces are 16 times more oil intensive, and Texas is a net importer of oil. The Department of Defense can always get the oil it needs, albeit at a high and volatile price, but the long uncounted cost of delivering that fuel to the battle space is almost often enormously higher. It's about 20 to 36 percent of the total cost of deployment in Afghanistan. More broadly, logistics chiefly for fuel use about half of DOD's personnel and a third of its budget. Long fuel chains vulnerabilities put the mission at risk, and the cost in blood is even higher. Over 1,000 U.S. service members have been killed in convoy attacks in the past decade, mainly hauling fuel. But fuel convoys we no longer need cannot be attacked. Fuel vulnerabilities that red teams exploited to win recent war games can be leaned out or even zeroed out. So saving fuel is a force protector. It's a force multiplier freeing up fuel guards and logisticians to be trigger pullers. It's a force enabler radically increasing range and nimbleness. It's a key to transformational multi-divisional realignments from tail to tooth that could save many tens of billions of dollars a year. Endurance therefore combines greatly improved energy efficiency and autonomous energy supply to extend reach, dwell, agility, and flexibility. By shrinking or even eliminating fuel logistics, endurance enables affordable dominance in persistent, dispersed, and remote combat or stability operations, and it enhances overmatch in traditional operations. 
Now, to move that way, DOD has lately begun to value save fuel at its fully burdened cost delivered to the platform in theater in wartime. And this makes save fuel typically one or two orders of magnitude more valuable. That plus new energy key performance parameters will make new platforms vastly more efficient. Their innovations will then come back to the civilian sectors, uh, sector, which uses 50 odd times more oil, and catalyze radical energy efficiency in the civilian platforms, just as in the past, military science and technology created the internet, the global positioning system, the jet engine and microchip industries that transformed the civilian economy. And then a nation that needs no oil may feel less need to fight over oil. Think no more pipeline guarding in far off neg emissions in the Persian Gulf, mission unnecessary. I mentioned that far more efficient military platforms could not only save oil, but dramatically boost warfighting effectiveness. So let me give you a few examples of the remarkable fuel-saving innovations briefed to our DSB panel a few years ago. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. Some uh, several fold more efficient and actually on typical mission profiles, five to 10 times more efficient blended wing body aircraft with doubled range and payload. Here's a, uh, an unmanned sensor craft with 50 hour loiter uh, 18 times fewer sorties and uh, half the cost and 97% fuel savings. Uh, engines that double your loiter time save up to 40% of fuel and are more reliable, often cost less. They're optimized to two operating points, not one. Optimal speed tilt rotor. What could you do with a helicopter that has tripled speed, five or six times the range, five or six times less specific fuel, consumption and it's quiet. We can re-engine with much better engines, things like the Abrams. Here's an extraordinary one uh, <clears throat> that Scott Badenoch has been developing with Tardec. Uh, it's a, a family of ultralight armored uh, land vehicles that, are, that have higher lethality. They protect you as well as an MRAP. Uh, they have a molded variable thickness elastomeric hull with uh, kind of a cockroach shell architecture, lots of obliquities that break up blast waves, but because it's elastomeric, it, it probably damps uh, a lot of the shock transmission that causes traumatic brain injury. That could be as important to uh, land vehicles as stealth was to aircraft. Uh, it, is, it has less weight, cost, and fuel use than an up-armored Humvee handles uh, in agility and acceleration and stability like a top-of-the-line pickup truck, and you can nicely load it in an Osprey or a KC-130. I'll say a little bit later about some hotel load work that we did earlier. Uh, now, on land, the kind of equivalent of that <laughs> Uh, is that about a third of the Army's total wartime fuel use is to run gensets averaging about 10% efficient, and most of those, 95% in this fob, are running inefficient air conditioners that cool uninsulated and often unoccupied tents. For this, we're getting people blown up in convoy attacks. What's wrong with this picture? Well, <clears throat> this is space cooling by cooling outer space, uh, but actually, you don't need electricity to provide coolth. Uh, and I dream of a Manx fob, no tail, no fuel logistics, no water logistics. I think we have the technology to do that. Think about actuators, which have had about an order of magnitude improvement in efficiency. Six applications of those on a typical carrier can save per hull on the order of 1.4 million pounds, 61,000 square feet, uh, and 20 or $25 million a year. And by some reckonings, 500 billets. Uh, <clears throat> we have ultralight composite structures progressing very rapidly. We have advanced propulsors that can save a great deal of noise and fuel. You ever see a propulsor that looks like that? That's a biomimetic Fibonacci spiral shape that Pax Scientific has developed with extraordinary properties. You can uh, spin this thing at 2,500 RPM underwater with no cavitation. I don't think you can do that with a bare cylinder because the boundary layer pulls the water apart, but effectively this has no boundary layer. Uh, land warriors are weighed down with batteries and they parachute in and get broken legs from all the batteries. How about a laptop for every child PC using two and a half watts running on solar with a backpack crank? Same technology is transferable. 
How about delivering 20 tons, ultimately hundreds of tons, uh, quietly to austere sites, no ground infrastructure, and cruising above 20,000 feet? How about a supercomputer built in Los Alamos years ago, ultra reliable, no downtime for years in an unheated, dusty, or, or uncooled, dusty hallway at high altitude, and with three or four times low, lower life cycle cost of ownership? You get the idea. There's a lot of important technology coming at us and think what it does for our capabilities. Now let me illustrate the naval capabilities with two small examples. The first one is sailing yacht Ethereal, a 58 meter catch launched in aught eight by Roald Heisman or my friend Bill Joy. I co-led a redesign as what a yachting magazine called the most technologically advanced and complex super yacht ever built, a quantum shift in energy efficiency. Our design charrette found ways to cut the prime mover power by 21%, the engine and fuel volume by a third, the diversity of engine spares to zero, in other words, they're all common spares, the electricity use by half, and the potable water use by 96%. The hybrid electric common bus design with its big lithium battery bank could run the hotel load for 10 hours for each hour of sailing, dragging the prop as a generator with a one knot uh, sacrifice of speed and supplemented with a little photovoltaic and some innovative upwind uh, or up, up mast uh, wind power. And most likely should never be becalmed or at anchor long enough to run out of battery power and need to turn on the electric generators. And that's good because we had trouble finding any that were small enough. Of course, the requirements of a luxury yacht do differ profoundly from those of a naval combatant. But there are important parallels in opportunities for design innovation, as we found out a decade ago when SecNav Danzig asked my team, led by my then exec, uh, Chris Lotspeech, uh, who's here today, to, to look at uh, hotel loads abo aboard a surface combatant. Uh, Princeton, CG-59, which was in the top quartile of her class efficiency. She's three times Ethereal's length, 21 times her displacement, 19 years older. Now, we only do unclass work, so we didn't look at propulsion or weapons or electronic systems, but instead we focused on the hotel loads that use a third of the Navy's non-aviation fuel. And we found ways to save up to about half of their energy with attractive economics at fuel prices one-third those of today. Our report is in the recommended readings for this conference. Even at 35 bucks a barrel, it was worth a present value upwards of $20 to save one watt of electricity. And that's not counting the mass or volume of the power systems and their fuel and how they compound in the design spiral or how they can decompound when you run them backwards. So if ship designers used power and mass and uh, <coughs> Uh, volume optimally, and then those savings compounded, how much smaller, lighter, faster, cheaper could our ships become? Well, here's a hint. There was one DDX design that they found would go faster with one less engine because its mass compounding more than offset its power. But we found the ship designers were not telling the designers of the weapon systems and the other stuff that goes into a ship what it's worth to save, a watt or a kilogram or a cubic meter. So how should they know how much efficiency to buy? Fully burdened cost of fuel and energy KPPs will help in principle to fix this problem, but they will require ever vigilant command attention to enforce because their underlying principles are not yet embedded in DOD's doctrine, strategy, structures, cultures, training, reward systems, and behaviors. So I would respectfully suggest to you current and future naval leaders an important opportunity here to introduce the endurance and resilience strategic vectors into doctrine at your service level Try them out, and if the Navy's and Marine Corps' forward-leading posture on endurance pays off as expected, as it's already starting to, then take them joint. Much as the maritime strategy helped to move the QDR and other elements of joint doctrine toward the emerging new strategic triad that my team formulated three decades ago, I was thrilled to see in the maritime strategy that preventing wars is just as important as winning wars. Well, our new strategic triad combines conflict prevention or avoidance with conflict resolution and with non-provocative defense. That's a whole other conversation. So back to reinventing fire. Let me move on now from our first big story, oil, to our second one, electricity. Less than 1% of our oil, but 95% of our coal makes electricity. So our second big story is about saving electricity, then making it differently. These twin revolutions promise more numerous, diverse, and profound disruptions in electricity than in any other sector. And it's going to be pretty challenging. We've got 21st century technology and speed colliding with 20th and 19th century institutions, rules, and cultures. 
Today, most of our electricity is wasted, and efficiency technologies keep improving even faster than they're applied, making the potential savings ever bigger and cheaper. Over the next 40 years, smarter building technologies and operations can save about half the electricity and gas in our buildings, worth $1.4 trillion net present value, despite 70% more floor space. An even more disruptive innovation can boost that energy saving to about 70%. It's called integrative design, and it can often make very large energy savings cost less than small or no savings, turning diminishing returns into expanding returns, much as we saw for, for cars. So, for example, my own 1984 house at uh, 7,100 feet elevation, 2,200 meters, in the Rockies, where it can go to minus 47F, minus 44C, has helped inspire 25,000 European buildings that, like this one, need no heating, and yet they have about normal construction costs, and they don't have to look like this to work like this. Now, come inside, and we just uh, got the other day our 36th banana crop with no furnace. In 1984, this house was saving 99% of its space and water heating energy, 90% of the electricity, half the water, with a 10-month payback. Today's technologies, which you just retrofitted, are even better. And the design approach works in any climate, including eliminating air conditioning with better comfort and normal, lower construction cost, up to at least 115F or 46 Celsius. The key is integrative design that gives multiple benefits from single expenditures. For example, this arch in the upper left uh, actually has 12 functions, but only one cost. The, sum, the same approach also works for big buildings, old and new. Last year's retrofit is expected to save 38% of the Empire State Building's energy, remanufacturing its 6,500 windows on site into super windows that are almost perfect in letting in light without heat, plus better lights and office equipment, cut the peak cooling load by a third. And then instead of replacing and expanding the old chillers, we could renovate and reduce them, saving $17 million of capital cost that help pay for the other improvements and cut the payback to three years. Similarly, retrofitting a 20-year-old curtain wall office building near Chicago could save three quarters of its energy at slightly lower cost than the regular 20-year renovation that saves nothing. Inefficiency works even better in military structures. You've probably heard that a $95 million uh, contract to foam insulate tents in Iraq is saving a billion dollars a year and taking 11,000 vulnerable fuel trucks off the road. But last year alone, heating and cooling inefficient U.S. military structures in both theaters cost $20 billion. And yet that foam hasn't yet even been applied in Afghanistan, where it pays back in 51 days in a big base and three days in a remote one, where supply is a 45-day struggle in the winter. And just like these civilian building examples I just gave you, the construction costs in Afghanistan would actually go down because the foam costs less than the equipment for power, heating, and cooling that it avoids. Now, in industry, the same integrative design approach can further increase the two-thirds of a trillion dollar savings available from low-hanging efficiency fruit that's fallen down and is mushing up around the ankles. We could actually cut industrial energy use in half while production rises 84%. For example, three-fifths of the world's electricity runs motors, half of that runs uh, pumps and fans, and those, uh, hmm, sorry, my slide somehow got scrambled here. Uh, and uh, the way it works is when you feed 100 units of coal into a power plant, there are so many compounding losses that only 10 units come out the pipe as flow. But <coughs> If you then uh, reduce the flow or friction in the pipe, every unit of reduction there saves 10 units of coal cost and emissions back at the power plant. And as you go back upstream, the uh, components also get smaller, simpler, and cheaper, so you save the most capital cost too. So imagine how this would work in a ship to multiply the savings in energy, space, weight, signatures, and cost. My team has lately found those kinds of snowballing energy savings in more than $30 billion worth of industrial redesigns in 29 diverse sectors, from data centers and chip fabs to mines and refineries. And typically, our retrofit designs in factories are saving 
about 30 to 60 percent of the energy with two or three year paybacks on retrofit, and in new facilities about 40 to 90 percent with lower capital cost. Uh, now, <clears throat> just to give an example of, of how this works, a Dutch colleague of mine took some pipes that, you know, uh, because the biggest motor use is, uh, is pumps, and pumps use move fluid through pipes, and he laid out the pipes differently. So he redesigned a typical industrial pumping loop to use at least 86% less pumping energy and cost less to build just by replacing long, thin, crooked pipes with fat, short, straight pipes. And that's how this design in Singapore saved 69% of the normal pumping energy at lower construction cost. Now, Accelerated by efficiency, how the world produces electricity is meanwhile shifting dramatically, as you can see by these additions of net new generating capacity in the world. Already, wind and solar power are growing explosively, while orders for central stations wither because they cost too much and they have too much financial risk. This renewable power revolution, the biggest infrastructure shift in history, is led by China, which is now number one in five renewable technologies, and last year blew past its 2020 wind power target. Power sources that get their economies from mass production, not from giant units, have more than swapped their share of global electricity production with nuclear power share. In fact, in 2008, Micropower made 91% of the world's new electricity, and renewables added half the world's new generating capacity. Last year alone, renewables, except Big Hydro, got $151 billion of private investment, added 52 billion watts, and surpassed global nuclear capacity. New U.S. nuclear plants, if any, are 100 plus percent subsidized, but they still can't raise any private capital because they have no business case. Uh, fortunately, <clears throat> uh, even without cost-effective nuclear power, we can still displace all our coal power, which is almost half the total, over 23 times over, uh, and I won't take the time now to go through this, by a mixture of efficiency, fuel switching, and renewables. Uh, and uh, they are all cheaper than building and running a new coal plant by the time you could, and enough to displace all the coal power once. Uh, is cheaper than running the coal plants that we have. So we have lots of options. But we're often told that only coal and nuclear plants can keep the lights on because they are, we are told, 24-7, while wind power and photovoltaics are variable and hence unreliable. But actually, no generator is 24-7. They all break so sooner or later. Coal and nuclear plants fail about 10 to 14 percent of the time and then you lose a billion watts in milliseconds, often for weeks or months and without warning. Grids routinely handle this kind of intermittence <clears throat> by backing up failed plants with working plants. And they can handle solar and wind's forecastable variations in just the same way. My team's hourly simulations have shown that very large renewable fractions can deliver highly reliable power when forecasted, integrated, and diversified by type and by location. For example, let's look at a typical load shape in Texas in the summer. <clears throat> After efficiency makes the loads each day smaller and less peaky, we can install wind power in green, uh, photovoltaics in yellow, and they won't exactly match the load, but flexible demand and smart charging and discharging of electrified autos, think of that as distributed storage, can mesh all the moving parts, even with, in this case, 86% variable renewables or even more if we use more of the demand response resource. And the other 14% or less, shown in, in aqua, uh, <clears throat> can come from dispatchable renewables like geothermal down at the bottom, small hydro, solar thermal electric, or feedlot biogas burned in existing gas turbines. Now, no bulk storage is needed then in this scenario for 86% variable renewables. No, some utilities do already integrate variable renewables to quite a high degree in this way. That's how four German states last year got 43 to 52 percent of their total annual electricity from wind power. But besides normal fluctuations in demand and in renewable supplies, the electricity system is also subject to extreme events, coal train derailments, frozen up coal piles or barges or plants, 
common mode nuclear failures due to drought or heat wave or accident or slow restart after a scram. In fact, nine units scrammed in the odd three northeast blackout. Uh, they were running perfectly at 100% output, went to zero in the blackout, and it took two weeks to get them fully back. They were only 3% of output for the first three days because of xenon and samarium poisoning. So they're kind of anti-peakers. They're guaranteed unavailable when you most need them. Now, for that matter, most U.S. reactors are vulnerable to credible physical attack, even from off-site. But even more worrisome are larger-scale events like a major earthquake, a severe geomagnetic storm, or a physical or cyber attack on key transmission assets. And the latter two events, you notice, have maximum magnitude of effect. This is from Captain Pugh at uh, Department of Homeland Security. Uh, <clears throat> and they could destroy key equipment that takes years to custom build abroad. They could black out upwards of half our population, potentially for years, at a cost of trillions of dollars a year, and it's questionable whether the nation could even recover from such an event. Now, because DOD cannot rely on such an inherently vulnerable grid for mission continuity, our Defense Science Board report in Aud 8, More Fight, Less Fuel, recommended that the department get its fixed facilities off the grid and shift to efficient use of electricity and to more diverse dispersed renewable supplies. Specifically, we recommended a shift to on-site or near-site generation, preferably renewable, which about 90% of Kona spaces can do, often to economic advantage. And we recommended reorganizing the grid into uh, netted, islandable microgrids that can interchange at will with the commercial grid, but if it fails, can stand alone at need, uh, temporarily or indefinitely. That is the same inherently resilient architecture that, of all places, Cuba used a few years ago to reduce its serious blackout days from 224 in 2005 to 3 in 2006 and 0 in 2007. It's also the way my own house works. I don't even know when the grid fails. We had about six power failures in the past month in snowstorms, uh, <clears throat> and I don't even know uh, because all the loads are served regardless. There are already at least 20 civilian microgrid experiments worldwide, and this new grid architecture makes customers highly resilient against disruption, whether by accident or malice. It can equally sustain vital services in surrounding communities, like where most of our people live around bases. It can help nucleate restart of the failed grid. DOD case studies of this approach have been launched in Norfolk, Vandenberg, and Texas. They're being tested in 29 Palms. They're being refined at Sandia and by PACOM and NORCOM. And I hope the Navy, whose Dahlgren experts have been critical in this effort, and the Marine Corps will continue shifting all their facilities rapidly towards resilience, the other big strategic vector I'm suggesting here, uh, turning the blackout-induced loss of critical missions from inevitable to nearly impossible. Let me also add parenthetically, since I see that our program later on mentions small modular reactors that for good reasons neither our Defense Science Board panel nor the Jasons endorse this approach. Well, now that you see why resilience is as vital as endurance to DOD's mission, I hope it's also clear that the society, economy, and way of life that you defend needs these attributes of resilience and endurance as well. And that's why my team emphasized resilience as a goal for our nation's electricity system as a whole. Now, reinventing fire explores four electricity futures that differ very little in cost, the red box at the upper right, but they differ enormously in risk. This is a business as usual future. It has high financial, fuel, and climate risks. Its over centralized grid is vulnerable to those cascading and potentially nation shattering blackouts I referred to. Now let's change the three big components from the bottom up, uh, <coughs> nuclear, coal, and gas, uh, and see if we can fix some of those risks. If we use new nuclear build and so-called clean coal to reduce climate risks, that will cost more. It intensifies the financial and technical risks. It retains all the other risks. Or we could get climate-safe power without the extra cost, by quintupling today's utility-scale renewable capacity so it meets 80 or 90 percent of our needs by 2050, ultimately 100 percent. This would sustain or improve reliability, cut technology and financial risk, and reduce blackouts. Finally, if we let distributed generators compete fairly with centralized ones, that could essentially eliminate the blackout risk 
by organizing the grid into islandable microgrids. And this resilient future would cost about the same as business as usual, maybe a bit less, but it would manage all of its risks and maximize customer choice, entrepreneurial opportunity, and innovation. These transitions to renewable power do require difficult regulatory reforms, barrier busting for efficient use, a smart grid, maybe adding some transmission, purging obstacles to fair competition and interconnection. Public policy can speed or slow these powerful market trends. Military power systems can help lead the way. Together, these transformations in efficient use and in diverse, dispersed renewable supply are starting to flip the whole electricity sector on its head. You recognize <clears throat> the traditional structure, giant coal and nuclear plants, augmented with big gas plants, a little efficiency of renewables. And the utilities that have long done this and are very good at it were rewarded, as most still are, for selling you more electricity. But now, especially where regulators reward cutting customers' bills, the market is shifting massively towards efficiency, renewables, cogeneration, and ways to blend them all together reliably with little or no bulk electricity storage. These best buys are also the most effective solutions to climate change, nuclear proliferation, energy insecurity, and energy poverty. Now combine the electricity and oil revolutions, the supporting efficiency revolutions in buildings and industry, similar opportunities with natural gas and directly burned coal, and you have the really big whole story, reinventing fire. The synthesis that I've sketched for you shows how business motivated by profit, supported by civil society and mindful markets, enabled by smart policies that can all be done at a state level, sped by military leadership, can lead us off oil and coal by 2050 and natural gas thereafter. Efficient use of energy in transport, buildings, and industry, smarter use of energy services, renewables, and fuel switching can save over nine trillion dollars in gross present value, that's twice what they cost, while resolving today's serious security, financial, and climate risks. Business can lead this transition and compete for the five trillion net dollar prize. Our armed forces can lead it too, saving lives, missions, and money. Our energy future is not fate but choice to be exercised very flexibly, and that choice is in the hands of people like you. That's very good hands. Now, the rich synthesis that I've sketched drives Rocky Mountain Institute's portfolio of sectoral implementation initiatives. <clears throat> Four are underway in deep retrofit of commercial buildings, super efficient but same cost new production housing, next generation electric utilities, and factor 10 engineering, 10XE, for radical efficiency in industry and in all sectors. This is our plot for the nonviolent overthrow of bad engineering. Uh, we've spun off a fifth initiative in heavy trucks to the roughly 300 firm North American Council for Freight Efficiency that we helped set up. We're exploring an initiative in civil and military fleet vehicles, supported by our project Get Ready, which is speeding deployment of electrical ve electric vehicle infrastructure in over 15 cities. And we continue to support applying endurance and resilience both in OSD and in the services. What you've heard here rests on very detailed practical experience and empirical evidence. If I had here a deck of our analytic support, it would be over upwards of 2,000 slides and you would not want to see it. Uh, and I think what I've told you does reflect where the smart companies are headed. Of course, there is still a lot of old thinking out there. As Oilman and Morris Strong said, not all the fossils are in the fuel. But as, uh, <laughs> as DuPont's former chairman, Edgar Woolard, said in another context, firms hampered by old thinking won't be a problem because ultimately they won't be around. Uh, if you think anything I've said sounds too good to be true, just reflect on Marshall McLuhan's remark, only puny secrets need protection. Big discoveries are protected by public incredulity. <laughs> Please consider how you can grasp these opportunities in your work and become more engaged with our work in making the world richer, fairer, cooler, and safer by reinventing fire together. Thank you for your kind attention and your good work. I believe we have time for a few questions, sir. You've uh, described a, sort of a steak dinner that is half the price is 
twice as big, three times better tasting, and we lose weight by eating it. Um, <laughs> if I knew how to make such a steak, two things would be certain. By tomorrow, I'd have more private investors than I would have places to invest their money, <coughs> and uh, I would wipe out once and for all vegetarianism. <laughs> so uh, my question is, why would my new steak dinner need any government subsidies at either the product development stage or the consumer stages? I, I feel like I'm missing something. Uh, I didn't believe I called for any subsidies. Uh, oh, I thought there was a, um, I thought you mentioned early on something about a, uh, an incentive. A, a fee bait. Yeah. The fee bait is revenue neutral, sir. The fees on the inefficient cars pay for the rebates to the efficient cars. The reason you do that is that private buyers of cars want their money back in at most two or three years, whereas society has a much longer view. Uh, <clears throat> it has a real discount rate of maybe 3% a year, not 60-odd. And <clears throat> that spread in discount rate means that the private buyer uh, finds it about as unimportant whether to buy efficiency as whether to buy floor mats whereas I mentioned earlier the $1.5 trillion externality to society of buying oil, and we can only shed that by getting off oil. That means taking a long view. So the purpose of the, the revenue neutral fee bait is to broaden the price spread within each size class to arbitrage that spread and discount rate so that private buyers will take the same long view in their car purchase that society does but there is no net effect on Treasury revenue except, I suppose, a net gain because it's quite stimulative for the automakers and helps them gain market share and jobs and revenue. But your private investors would not cover that? It's not an issue for private investors because they don't help you buy your car. It's a, it's a private purchasing decision where that market failure arises. Uh, <clears throat> there. I think the, there is still a case, by the way, for R&D public funding uh, to correct, again, a very well-known set of market failures in uh, how we invest in new technology. Uh, but I'm not calling for any new taxes, subsidies, or mandates. Uh, and indeed, I would be delighted to see the whole energy system desubsidized so everything could compete fairly on merit. That's not where we are now. It's enormously distorted. Uh, and uh, I, I think what we basically need in energy policy, and this would probably be enough to do almost all the jobs I described, is to let all ways to save or produce energy compete fairly at honest prices regardless of their type, technology, size, location, or ownership. I wonder who wouldn't be in favor of that. It would be really interesting to find out. Sir. Uh, thanks a million for a really brilliant presentation. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, but let me ask you, uh, in the context of the American political system, you have completely avoided the issue of the interests that are tied to various components of this entire grid. And as we saw recently in California, the amount of money that flowed in and the discussions of emissions, et cetera, uh, you haven't really covered that political spectrum and economic spectrum tied to all these policy decisions. Yeah, let me just say two quick things about that. First. You may have noticed that this approach is strongly trans-ideological because it's focused on outcomes, not motives. It doesn't matter in this context whether you care most about national security or about profits and jobs and competitive advantage or about climate and environment. You would do exactly the same things anyway. So if we focus on the outcomes and don't insist that you agree about why we should do it, which has become a political habit of late, uh, <clears throat> then I think we can get very far on the things that we would all agree about, and then the things we don't agree about would become superfluous. Second, we do need some new policies to either unlock or speed the transition I described. 
They are, in general, not the policies normally described. They are not fiscal. They are not about subsidies and taxes. Uh, they're not about altering relative prices or distorting them further. Uh, but they are, for example, things like uh, rewarding utilities for cutting your bill, not for selling you more electricity, or fee baits for new autos. Those are the two most important, and there are a number of subsidiary ones. But every one of them can be done at a, administratively or at a state level. In fact, many like the utility rules can only be done at a state level. So this is an end run around congressional gridlock. No act of Congress is required. There is, I suppose, one trivial exception that we sacrifice a quarter million barrel a day of truck diesel savings if we can't harmonize uh, weight rules on federal highways uh, with what we should do for the states. But that's only about a tenth of the biofuel we would need, so I don't think that's a significant issue. Yes. Sir. I think that's a very good question for private markets to settle by seeing who wants to invest in either, if either. There, let me back up a step. The U.S. has been pumping oil faster and longer than anybody else, so we're more depleted than anybody else. So the reality of our oil situation is terribly simple. A marginal barrel is more expensive at home than abroad. And for that reason, uh, in a market economy, there are only three things you can really do about it whose right names seldom used are protectionism, trade, and substitution. Protectionism means you either tax foreign oil to make it look costlier than it is or subsidize domestic oil to make it look cheaper than it is. The latter is particularly dumb because it suppresses efficient use. But the whole logic of protectionism, I think, is faulty because it's, it supposes that the solution to depletion is to deplete faster what Dave Brower called strength through exhaustion. Uh, uh, trade, which is what our allies like Germany and Japan are very good at, uh, means you unsentimentally buy oil from wherever it's cheapest uh, and then get good at earning the money to pay for it and maintaining good relations with its exporters. We have not been as good lately as we should at either of those things. A third solution is substitution. If there's a cheaper way to do what you were doing with the oil, do that first, and that's what I was talking about. I was substituting efficiency and renewables because they would beat any kind of oil. And in fact, seven years ago, for uh, Jay Cohen, when he led ONR, and for Andy Marshall in net assessment, we did a book you can download free at oilendgame.com uh, called Winning the Oil Endgame. Uh, and that showed how to eliminate US oil use by 2025 at an average cost of 15 bucks a barrel, 12 on the demand side and the other half, 18 on the supply side. I don't think either of the resources you mentioned comes near to beating that. So uh, think about it this way. If, if I were to identify for you, let's say the eight and a half million barrels a day that my wildcatters just found drilling in the Detroit formation or the one and a half we found drilling in the Seattle formation and so on, that would add up to something like uh, I think 14 million barrels a day of nega barrels and 12 TCF a year of saved gas at, at under a buck a million BTU. So if you were to go to the ends of the earth or even to Utah to drill for very expensive oil and somebody else found all that cheap oil under Detroit, wouldn't you be embarrassed and maybe bankrupt? We, we need to drill the most prospective place first and those are in general on the demand side. Uh, I, Uh, not very high because this will be the story of whale oil. Uh, as, uh, and, and here's what I mean by that. 
There was a brilliant op-ed in the Wall Street Journal in, I think, November 73 or thereabouts by an obscure Texas A&M economics professor named Phil Graham, and he got it exactly right. Now, here's the story. Now, 1850, our fifth biggest industry in America was whaling. Most of our houses were lit by whale oil lamps. We even exported whale oil to Europe, but whales were getting shy and scarce, uh, and the hunting was harder and harder, and the prices started drifting up, and this elicited competition from oil and gas, both at the time made from coal. This was long before Edison's electric light. Uh, and in the nine years before Drake struck oil in 1859, five-sixths of the whale oil lighting market went away to those competitors. The whalers were astounded to run out of customers before they ran out of whales. The remnant whale populations were saved by profit-maximizing capitalists and technological innovators. <laughs> And soon, and soon the, the, uh, the, the, the whaling fleet was reduced to begging for federal subsidies on national security grounds. In 1879, Edison invented the electric light. The rest is history. It's going to be like that. Again, oil is becoming already uncompetitive even at low prices before it becomes unavailable even at high prices. Thank you.